Hi, how are you? Hey, good morning. Good morning. How are you today? Good, how are you? I'm good. Beautiful out, huh? Yes. It's a busy Monday. What is that for? Yeah, it's a pay it forward board. If somebody comes in and they're running short on some funds, they can take the tag off and, and get a free coffee for the day. It kind of makes their day. Street. Oh, I'm Tom Griffin. Nice, nice to meet you. Um, you live around here? I live here, yeah, I live here in Peabody. I work in Peabody, too. Okay. Yeah, no I grew kidding. up around the corner, on, on, right on the corner of Washington Street. Oh, no kidding. Oh, I grew up just on the other end of Shoulder Street. Oh, yeah, right across the Salem line. Okay. But I, I worked around here. I worked. My first job was actually McDonald's. Rip, 1981. No kidding. Huh? Oh, yeah. yeah. It was a tough job. Yeah. You know, but it taught you a lot of lessons. You know. Absolutely. Are you a Peabody High Island? Uh, Bishop Fenwick, but oh, close. You close, 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 close. We're, we're, we're competition. <laughs> That's all right, though. Um, you, so you've lived here for a long time. Uh, I, I've lived. I moved back here a couple years ago. Okay. You know, I was down in Saugus. Uh, my in-laws were down there, so we wanted to stay close to them. Uh, so my kids grew up down there, but but they're around the North Shore. So, you got any grandbabies? Yeah. I got one. He's over in Salem. Oh, my little, my, uh, I got four of them. So oh, good for you. Keep me busy. Yeah. Oh, they're awesome. Yeah, he's the apple of my eye, my yeah, little man. You know, Ronan. Imagine. You know, he keeps me busy. Keeps me grounded, too, I with all the stuff going on, you know? These days, we have so many, so many things happening that we lose sight of the magical little things. Oh, I know. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it helps you do a reset. With the grandbabies is always a good reset. Yeah, I'm jealous because my wife gets to spend more time because she, she's retired and she watches them two days a week. She's retired uh, recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she, she was a, she was a principal over in Lynn. So. Okay. Yeah, so she retired and uh, she takes him Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I get all, I get pictures, but that's you know, it's not the same. What looks like my numbers up? There you go. This is great. Talking. Yeah, you too. Let me give you my card. Oh, sure. Here's and mine as well. I would love to come see you and talk more about the work that you do. Excellent. Thank give me a call so anytime. Much. Nice I to shall. meet you. Likewise, Take care. Likewise. Have a great day. You too. Hi. I'm Michelle Lapoetica. I'm here with PBD TV. Oh. I'm here to interview the chief. Come on over. Come in. Good morning, Chief. This is Michelle with PBD. Oh, hey, Michelle. Hello there. Good to see nice you again. Nice to see you again. How's everything? Ah, oh, everything's great. Great. Thanks for coming I down. I am so dying to have this conversation with Alrighty, you. Alrighty, grab a seat. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, don't mention it at all. You, you know what? I would have never imagined in a million years in that coffee shop that this is what you did for a living. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So tell me, how did this come about? How did you become a police officer? Well, I always, going to school and everything, I always wanted to be involved in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, actually, my great-grandfather was a patrolman in the city of Salem back in the early 1900s. Wow. So it kind of is in the family. Um, so I went to uh, Salem State, okay. and I took the police exam, and I got on the police department in Salem um, in 1987. Um, so I ended up with the Salem Police Department. Okay. I had a... Um, very good bunch of men and women to work with. Uh, great Chief Bob St. Pierre, another great Chief Paul Tucker, who's now our DA. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I worked for Paul for a long time in the um, investigation division. Uh, we did, Paul and I did all the internal affairs investigations mm -hmm. for the city over there. We investigated all the major crimes in, in Salem for a good 20 years or so. Yeah. Um, and I rose up to the rank of captain. And in 2014, an opportunity opened up where uh, Chief Champagne was retiring, and the city was city of Peabody was going to do a, a wide search. So I I, um, I took the opportunity to take the exam, and got lucky, and I, uh, I ended up here back in August of 2014, wow. and I've been so here been ever since. Then? Yeah, yeah, and okay. it's been great. It, it's been a great uh, great uh, career move for me. Um, the Mayor Betancourt's a great guy to work for. Mm -hmm. um, very supportive. The city council has always been very supportive of the police department, uh, even the community. I walk around the community and talk to people, and um, it's a really good feeling working here. I have a lot of great men and women uh, that work for me. I've been very lucky with our selection process. We've gotten some great candidates to, to come forward to be police officers. Awesome. Um, this is a really great city, and there's a lot of great people. These, uh, the guys and girls that work for me want to give back to the community because they, they appreciate it so much and uh, it's just been a wonderful trip so far. I love it. I, I mean, I grew up in Peabody and I've seen so many changes 
happen in the community. And, you know, it's a different world. Oh, things. absolutely it is, yes. Um, I know that a lot of, a lot of the, the world right now is suffering for a plethora of reasons as a result of this pandemic that oh. we're just yeah, coming out of. Yeah, that was very, very challenging for everybody, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And um, I know that mental health has been a huge, a it huge is. issue. It is. There's been a, an incredible uptick uh, in a lot of uh, issues surrounding mental health since uh, the pandemic. Everybody seems to be really on edge. You can see it in the way they're driving. Yeah. You can see it in the way even just their behaviors out in the community. Our responses have, have upticked. You can see it. Uh, the hospitals are getting kind of overwhelmed with people coming in just to deal with uh, you know, mental health. Yeah. So and how, how, how would you say you, cha you ta tackle that challenge? How would you say that you take it on here in the department when it comes to your officers? And That's something that's always been very concerning of mine. Um, as I said, I did a lot of uh, internal investigations in Salem and a lot of times there was issues um, where people didn't manage their uh, stress the right way. Right. It manifested itself in a bad way and we had to take action. Um, so when I came over here, I, I talked to some of the union officials about what's the best thing we can do for our, for our men and women when they deal with stressful events. We deal with all kinds of difficult situations that um, most people never even realize in their lives. And my men and women are seeing things two and three times a year that maybe you wouldn't see in your whole lifetime. And it impacts them emotionally. Mm -hmm. And if they don't manage it the right way, it's going to manifest itself in a negative way. And that's what we absolutely don't want right. because then it creates issues in the community. So I talked to, it was actually Officer John Nelson at the time, um, and he was really a big component of mental health for officers. And we would work with what was the Boston Peer Support Unit because uh, okay. they had a big unit that dealt with the Boston police officers. And w over time, we got to know a couple of the uh, retired guys from there, one guy by the name of Tommy Famillari and another guy by the name of Brian Fleming. And they, they talked to me and they said, listen, you can build your own peer support unit within your department and within your region uh, if you want, and we can get you the training. There's an International Critical Incident Stress Foundation based out of Baltimore, and they have different models of different types of intervention you can do depending on the severity of the situation. Mm -hmm. So is that specifically for police officers? It can be for anybody, but you can do it specifically. We do a law enforcement one because mm -hmm. it's specifically um, police officers are a little um, nervous about talking about their emotions to right. anyone other than police officers. And it helps if I have a police officer that's a veteran police officer that's been through a situation that now I have a younger officer is faced with dealing and they can they can look up to that officer and that officer can kind of forecast what might be going on emotionally with them right. uh, it, it helps them process that because they don't if no one tells you that you're going to be upset by something and you you may not feel like going to the gym for the next week or you may you may have a difficult time sleeping you may think there's something wrong with you but that's right. a normal that's reaction a normal for your body um, so we built um, together with Tommy and Brian and, and a bunch of um, police chiefs in the area we built a what we call a SISM team, and then it expanded into a, a larger one where um, we belong to a regional policing service called NEMLEC, mm -hmm. Northeast Metropolitan Law, Northeast Massachusetts Law Enforcement Council. Mm -hmm. So right now we have a team of about 70 officers with, um, I think there's five clinicians, five to seven clinicians, five clergy members, and we'll respond anywhere pretty much in Essex County or Middlesex County when there's a tragic event and we'll we'll focus our attention specifically on the mental health of the officers that um, respond to that scene. That's beautiful. So it gives them a way to kind of get it out of their Absolutely. system and, and, and it's, it's not perfect because we're not doctors and we're not psychologists no. and they may need that depending on the nature of what it is but it's it's a way to kind of let them know there's people there for them. Um, you know we're very concerned about obviously um, you know officers taking their own lives and we want to try and help intervene in that and, and let them know, you know, there's, there's always tomorrow and the next day and whatever's going on, it's going to be okay in the long run. Um, so we work hard on that. That really is something that I, I, I wanted to put a big focus on. Um, you know, I saw over the years in Salem, a lot of, a lot of guys have a real hard time. Yeah. And really back then we didn't know about it. We didn't, we were like macho guys. Mm -hmm. We don't oh, brush it off, you know, part of the job kid that kind of stuff and yeah. it's just not right that's not the right approach 
we have to we have to recognize it, deal with it, and hopefully make it better. Yeah, and that's a beautiful thing. I worked um, years ago. I worked in a hospital emergency room, and um, even from before then, I had already developed and established really beautiful friendships with many police officers in the city. And um, working in the emergency room, you know, some of the that's the a tough calls job too. In, yeah. Um, my first week on the job, we had you know a gunshot wound. Sure. Yeah. Um, so like to see how they are impacted. Mm -hmm. um, we civilians, you know, it's a headline for us. Yeah. You know, it, we move on and we go on about our lives like nothing happened. But when you walk into something like that. Yeah, it can be hard. Yeah, and you can't unsee that. No, you can't and you, unhear that. And the, the, the thing with a police officer is when you walk into that seat, mm -hmm. you need to maintain your composure. You, you can't go, oh my God, look at this. Yeah. You have to be, because people are looking to you for stability. Right. Because they're in a chaotic scene and they're looking for you to be the, the way out of it and if you're the one if you if you can't maintain your composure and you start to you know it, it it's not going to make the scene better and that's what we're there we, we need to make that scene better so sometimes we have to check ourselves mm -hmm. in terms of our emotional feelings until afterwards and we need to make sure we remember to revisit that and 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 get those emotions out in the right way it's beautiful to hear you speak like this and i i feel like it's important to name the parallels within what you're saying. Like, I'm a mom mm -hmm. and a grandmom. I work with youth. Good for you. Thank you. And I, you know, I, for me, it's like to be able to recognize, okay, these are my feelings right now, and, and I have to keep them in control because I got little ones watching. Right, yeah. They can't They're going to cue off what, right. you, what you do. So to, ha to have to self-regulate in a moment of high stress or, like, intense, like, danger or whatever it may be is not easy no no you know? and how do you turn that off yeah it's yeah. hard it's hard because yeah. you could get um even even just going to a routine uh, like sometimes these guys in the middle of the night uh, there's a burglar alarm going off mm -hmm. so uh, their stress goes up because but it could be just a false alarm right, right and it's up and down constantly for them and that's not healthy for them either and that that causes some physical health issues if they're you know Heart rates going up and down and up and down. The too, fact so. that you are taking such a proactive approach and like a, a, a resolve-guided approach to mental health within your within your department. Um, recently, there's been many studies that speak on emotions mm -hmm. and how and how they interact and affect our physical. Sure. Being. Yeah. Um, and I I I gotta say I don't know how you guys do it. You know, because if the body truly remembers and, you know, stores trauma. Right. I think that's why it's important to get yeah. that trauma out when you can and in a safe and, and controlled environment. Like I say, we have, we'll have a meeting in a room like this with chairs around a table like this and, and just uh, there'll be a clinician there and, and they'll just talk through what just happened and, and how it impacted you and what would you have liked to have been different and you know and then the clinician or, or a clergy member will forecast for them okay don't be surprised if if you have a hard time sleeping right. you know um don't be surprised if you don't feel like going to the gym like i said or going out for a run um but don't let that linger too long yeah. you know what i mean and if and if you find two three four weeks from now you're still having these kind of problems Come talk to the clinician. We have we have a great EAP program here in Peabody. What does EAP stand uh, for? Employee Assistance Program. Nice. So we can we can connect them to the right kind of people, or if they want to do it privately, um, th there's a we have a list of different facilities or different um, clinicians and, and psychiatrists that they can go see privately. Nice. All that stuff, and, and the key part about that is is those meetings are um, confidential. Even even if my guys are involved in it, I have no idea what's being said in there. So they have the freedom to just, they may not be happy with a decision I made and they want to vent about it, and that's fine. And and if that helps them be better in the long term, then, that, then that's what that's all about. That's so refreshing to hear from someone in a position of authority. <laughs> because oftentimes, I mean, even in parenting, you're, you're, you're a yeah. parent, yep. so you know that sometimes you have to... Oh, maybe I was too hard on them. <laughs> you know, maybe well, I wasn't. There, yeah. Maybe I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't soft enough. You know, like yeah. it's always. It was yeah. always trying to find that balance. So for yeah. you to be trying to maintain that balance within yourself, yeah. and then trickle that into your department, it's it's an it's an extraordinary thing to see happen. For my office is actually, I um, as I'm, 
one of the things I want to do is I'm gonna, we're going to be sending these out to every police officer this week, and it's a uh, it's one of the leading books in the uh, area of um, police officer stress. Emotional and, and survival for law enforcement. Yeah, it's a great book. And it's uh, for for officers and their families. Right, right, wow. because because you bring uh, as much as you try not to. Sometimes you bring you this bring home, it home yeah. and uh, and it helps the family understand what's going on. Um, you know, I like. I didn't want to go home and tell my family some of the things that I was right. dealing with at work. And it wasn't that I was upset at them. I just didn't want them to hear some of the stories yeah. that, of the things we, when I was an investigator, we had to deal with. And um, it's really not good dinner conversation. Right, right. You know and what I mean? Being a, I, I can't even imagine. Like, there's things that people in the real world should know. Like, outside of this uniform, you're a father, you're right, a grandfather, yeah. you're yeah. a husband, you know? Um, so for for you to come home after a, a big incident happens, you know, and have a little a little child, grandpa, grandpa, you know, <laughs> all all over wanting to play and have fun and happy, yeah, you have to turn that off. It's, you know, like yeah. people need to understand what that takes. It can and be what that challenging entails. for yeah. people, yeah. So so books like these and and different. Uh, there's a lot of work in this area right now. Uh, so I and you got this for we all got this for all our offices. They're going to be getting it this week. Um, That's when beautiful. we we actually got a grant earlier in the year, and I got that same book for every one of every one of the SISM team members as well. So um, we're, I, I just want to have the conversation constantly. Uh, we have probably uh, seven or eight offices just in this department that are trained in peer support. Okay. And if if one of my offices is having a hard time, they don't have to come in here because I know this can be an intimidating place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they can talk to their peers and access all kinds of resources that way as well. So it's just a, a way to kind of let, let my team know we care about them and we want them to, you know, work through their issues in a healthy way. In a healthy way. You this know, is because great. It, you can't be a good community policing officer if, if you're struggling and, and what's going on inside of you, you take it out on somebody out on the street. It just, yeah. it just, and we see that and that's unfortunate and it's not right. So we need to do whatever we can to address it. And I got to say thank you. Oh. You know, and I want to I want to name that because it's important to me. Um, my father, I grew up in Peabody. Um, my father had a lot of Peabody police officers that were friends <laughs> of his. Um, and he always taught me to to, ha to create friendships with the police right, department. Yeah. And, um, you know, these past few years have been rough. Oh, yeah. For the police yeah. department. Yeah. So to see you taking this, these, not this, these multiple beautiful initiatives is a breath of fresh air. Well, and thank I you. Gotta say thank, thank you for you. that. So you have this huge mental health endeavor that you've embarked on to help your your team. Mm. Um, and I've I've heard through the news that you have some other programs here in Peabody that you've been working yeah. on. Yeah, we we work on a, a lot of different community based programs where we want to uh, reach out to the community and connect with them. Um, uh, two in particular is, is a program with autism mm -hmm. and involving um, members of our community who have autism and how we can respond better to those situations. Same thing with um, members of our community who have Alzheimer's. Um, sometimes we don't always get it right and we right. recognize or we see things a particular way and, and, and it may be something different. If someone's reacting in a way that um, we might perceive to be a threat but it's actually them reacting to us because they get uh, upset because of the blue lights oh, and we don't anxiety, know that yeah. you know what i mean and if we can find that out ahead of time and know when we go to respond say to your house that that don't use the siren near the house because it might it might upset the child okay great then then that just lessens the stress for everybody and so it makes you have it, a system that tells your officers this you can come in and you can fill out some paperwork and we'll we'll be able to put it into our computer system where if we're going to you know 95 Main Street and we're going to see your family for whatever reason, um, even if it's a medical call or whatever, um, we'll know that ahead of time. The officer will be made aware when you respond there, this is the situation. That's and amazing. And we can respond in a, in a more professional uh, manner than not knowing and all of a sudden now, because of something we did, mm -hmm. the situation has started to escalate. So it's an informed response, basically, Correct. because yeah. you, you know what yeah. you're walking into in right. a sense. Right, and, okay. and we know how we can, our job is to make someone's bad day better. Right. And if we go and make their bad day worse, that's not, that's that's not, not effective for anybody. Um, we want to try and make it better. And, and on the same side with, the, with, um, with Alzheimer's, if, if we have information where someone may wander to, um, 
because I mean, there could be times at three o'clock in the morning, it, it could be um, extremely dangerous for them to be outside. So right. we want to relocate them as fast as possible. And we also want to be able to know that, you know, there, there may be some different behaviors and this is why. Right. And it's not that they're a threat to us or anything like that. It's just, this is something that they can't control. Right. And we actually, with the, with the autism, because um, sometimes when we pull a car over, um, there may be a child in the back seat or and, and the lights and the noise and uh, can get them stressed up. So we, we actually have these sleeves that you can put on the um, seat belt mm -hmm. and it says right on it, um, you know, I may not read, I forget the exact words, but it's like, it indicates autism and it has a police patch on it. So if an really? officer walks up to the window and he sees that, he knows, okay, let's... Tone it down. Yeah, yeah. Take, it, take, it, take it slow. Wow. And yeah, so we, we want to work with the community to make our interactions with them as positive as possible. That's amazing. If you had the opportunity to describe your leadership in this department with three words, what would those three words um, be? I think I'm a um, fair, mm -hmm. uh, approachable, mm -hmm. um, and thoughtful. Okay. Yeah. I'd, I mean, say, I, I'd say you hit it on the money. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I try and have an open door policy if people want to come in and talk to me about things. And, you know, because a lot of times I have to make decisions and only I have all the information and some other folks may only have part of the information. Right. They may not understand what's going on and why. And particularly with this generation, you have to kind of take those extra steps to get the information out. Absolutely. So we've received a lot of training in the, in the last four or five years in law enforcement about these exact topics because you know, we, we see things across the country that happen and we want, we want to learn from them so they don't happen here. And, you know, even, we may even have a couple of examples locally where we want to learn from it so we don't, we don't have it happen here or if it did happen here, it won't happen again. That's the idea. That's beautiful. The thing is, is that the, the men and women that work here are all sons and daughters of Peabody. Yeah. You know, they, the majority of them grew up here, went to either Peabody High or a local high school around here and they volunteered to come back to this police department to work here to give back to their community. And unfortunately, sometimes stressors create situations where they may do something they regret and we have to deal with it. But for the most part, we want to have positive, fun interactions with, uh, with the community. The last time I was in this building, I was a student at Higgins Middle School. Oh, no <laughs> at kidding. the old Higgins, right? <laughs> we came, it was a bike awareness thing or yep, something. Yeah, we just that actually did, did one uh, okay. a month ago up at, uh, up at the, the new middle school. Um, Jason Stone, we worked, he's a lawyer. Um, I got my local, first bike helmet here. Yeah, that's yep, what happened. Yep. We had a big bike, they call it a bike rodeo. And mm -hmm. Jason Stone, he's an attorney at, um, here locally in Peabody, and he funded the whole thing, and they got one of the uh, Celtics players. I forget his first name, but Scalabrini. Mm -hmm. And uh, some, some of the folks, uh, Lucky came down and the kids had a great time. It was a Saturday afternoon up at the uh, so middle school. So you still school. do this? Oh yeah, so yeah, we're else? worried about that because, and we've done some other things with that, uh, trying to educate kids. Yeah. Because there's a lot of kids riding around without helmets oh, on. Honey, yeah. And it's really, it, uh, you could have a, you know, a major head injury very Absolutely. easily. Um, so we, we gave away a bunch of helmets. Um, sometimes my guys will go around and um, if they see a kid riding on a bike with a helmet, they'll, they'll give them a coupon for a nice, you know, five bucks off at uh, Tom Gould's okay. place at uh, Treadwell's. You know, things like that. We try to, in, just to encourage kids. Or if they don't have a helmet, we tell them, come down to the police station. We have a bunch. And, um, you know, we want to work with the community on that, too, because no one likes going to a call where a kid didn't have a helmet. Right. And then the long-term impacts that can come out Absolutely. of that with the, with the um, traumatic brain or head injuries. Um, they can be devastating. Yeah. And yeah. what other programs do you have happening in the community? One of the great programs, when I, when I first came over here, we used to do it in Salem, and then um, I brought it over here to the middle school because the middle school is a, a great venue. Mm -hmm. It's air-conditioned, so it's a summertime program. Um, the district attorney's office is very um, heavily involved. We call it's, it goes by a couple different names. It used to be the deer camp, but now mm -hmm. it's you know the district attorney's camp where we bring in Incoming fifth graders from 11 cities and towns in the area, Salem, Beverly, Peabody, um, and they have a free week of camp. Um, they, they do a lot of educational programs on making the right choices when it comes to different things like bullying and drugs and things like that, but they also have a fun time too. Um, they'll spend the day with the fire department, 
learning how the hoses work, the ladders, the smokehouse. They'll have uh, canine offices from all over the state come in. That's amazing. How uh, much does that cost? Zero. It's Zero done for dollars. free. Yeah. Okay. So if if what happens is if there's a kid that that maybe a teacher in the school doesn't think they're going to be able to go to a camp over the summer, they'll make sure that kid gets uh, the information. They get enrolled. So by referral. Yeah, and That's they come amazing. right here, and it's um it's a it's a wonderful camp that uh, uh, we my guys love it because it gives them a great opportunity mm -hmm. to just hang out with uh, fifth graders and and we also work on a little bit of a. Um, leadership thing for older kids okay. and they're like role models for these fifth graders and and they basically do most of the work to be honest with you but it's a good way to get uh get kids some some leadership type yeah, training that's but, beautiful. but we also do do a citizens police academy too you, now that you mentioned that a pocket well, of surprises <laughs> it's a fun thing uh, i have a captain captain scott richards he developed mm -hmm. the whole curriculum it's a, it's a community policing tool that gets used a lot throughout the um country but but here we do it as a 10-week program and we do everything about policing from from soup to nuts um from recruiting to um you know uh, why we do what we do uh, we go over criminal law the actual the district attorney actually comes in and teaches uh the current you know state of you know criminal law and and okay. in courts yeah it's pretty cool it started with john blodgett because he he was um he was a local pbd guy mm -hmm. great guy and he retired and now paul tucker um has just just kept it going with that um he does I a great job a kid yeah, too. yeah yeah so like i said i worked for him for you know 20 20 years over right. in salem so it's a wednesday night uh, for a few hours and we'll have any different kind of policing service that we provide a representative from that from like the traffic department from the detective division from everything we'll come in and sit with the um and and sit downstairs and and talk to them about what they do why they may do something a certain way so for example if we're running a uh, speed trap on linfield street by land and sea it's not we're not out there trying to generate revenue we're out there trying to make the road safe because maybe our statistics show that county in linfield there's a lot of accidents so we want to slow people down mm -hmm. um, i don't believe in trying to do enforcement to make money for the city that's not my approach at all thank goodness yeah you say no that. i so many people think the opposite no you know? no and i, I it's uh, important that they know about yeah i have a hard time with that i tell my guys you know we take an oath to enforce the law so my my, my idea behind that is corrective action right take corrective action that's all that's what i want you to do that could be simply hey ma'am could you please slow down we had a bad accident hand last week we don't want to have another one and how would you feel you'd probably feel pretty bad if you were in a bad accident why don't you just do me a favor try and slow down yeah. and you'd be like oh, okay and it would it would resonate with you um if two weeks later you're still driving 60 miles an hour on linfield street then it's a different then story, it's a different story yeah. but at least we give you that opportunity mm -hmm. and and it's a way to kind of positively interact with the community and um like i said we i don't believe in in um any kind of you have to write this number of tickets or that it's just take corrective action solve the problem and if we can do it in in the most passive and, and positive way that's a win for everybody that's how yeah. i see it so i think that that helps build our community up it's a beautiful so, thing and yeah, I, well, I gotta you. say i i, I would have never again I, I would have never imagined in that this is this is great yeah and i gotta say thank you again oh no you know because our world needs more of this yeah. I know that it's there's much more to this job than meets the eye. And for years I've wanted to get the other side, you know, to be able to say something. Well, I'm glad we ran is, into each other, to yeah. be honest with you. And there is, there's a lot of, um, unfortunately, um, TV shows don't oh. tell you the whole story. Yeah. And um, it, it's an amazing job. I love this job. Um, I have a great men and women that work with me. And, and um, I, you know, I... I'm kind of jealous about how the job's going to transition into the future with all the technology and, yeah. the, and the abilities to be able to do things. Um, kids, 10 years from now, the job's going to be amazing. Um, you know, when I started, we were handwriting things on paper. Um, there were barely enough radios for all the guys. Mm -hmm. It was, and now it's like the technology and everything and the education, the training is going to be so much better. And um, it's going to, it's an awesome job, to be honest with you. And I really enjoy it. And um, you know, if you get to know, you have to remember, you went to high school with some of these kids mm -hmm. here, and you know how they are and who they are and, and yeah. what they're all about, and they, you know, 
Yeah, and even like still, like, you see a lot of that. You see people that grow up with these officers, and once they put the uniform and the badge on, it's like... Yeah, they it doesn't don't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. No, not it, at all. This is they still have, you know, they still bleed if you, yeah, if you yeah, poke them in the hand. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, there's some of them that are out there coaching and doing different things like that. They're family you know. people. Yep. Like, yeah, like, yeah. I, people... People need to understand that just because a person is in a position of authority, it doesn't mean they're not human. No. They no, still yeah. feel, they still make mistakes, they still have good days and bad days. Oh, yeah, yeah. So. And that's the thing. We try and manage that because our bad day shouldn't contribute to your bad that's day. Right. And that's what we have to, that's where we have to recognize that. And that's where our training needs to come in and, and you know, work on de-escalation and, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of things like with the autism and the in the um, Alzheimer's stuff, if get those tools that are going to help us do our job better. And I've been looking at this for a while. <laughs> so what is this? That's actually it's not a Lego. No, it's not. Well, it's kind of like a Lego, but it's uh, we're working to to build a new building. Okay. Uh, it's, but it's a 3D printing of the um, sketches of what we hope to be the new building. And this is actually the new building right here. And it. Uh, this is the old building that we're currently in this right now. This is where we're at right now. Yeah, and this is what we hope the new building will look like. And so where's the Higgins here? Right over building? here. So the Higgins is right here. Yeah, so it'll be nice. It'll be a nice big, like, campus. And, nice. and the architecture is, is going to be made to match the middle school, so it looks like both buildings belong right there. So it's not going to look right off-putting. No, not okay. at all. No, it's... And, and we stressed this right from the beginning. We want it to be a welcoming community-type mm -hmm. place. Um, so we're gonna, it, it's going to look like it belongs with the middle school. And it's good for safety reasons, having us right near the middle school Absolutely. if something were to happen. And, um, you know, we're going to have the fire department administration folks with us. Um, so if there's ever like a hurricane or something like that, and we need to open up the emergency management conference room to, to deal with that big situation, it'll You'll be right, have all, the right all there. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have some facilities so my offices can work out. We're also going to have a, a huge room where we can do, like I talked about, the future of training is a, is a lot of virtual reality stuff okay. so that um, we, we, can, we can utilize those types of uh, things. When I first started, like if, if our firearms training was point at that piece of paper and, <laughs> and that's just not, I mean, the most stress you had was the guy behind you yelling at you. Right, it right. doesn't get you into the adrenaline rush that you might see at one of these scenes and that's where mistakes can get made. Right. So we try and simulate them as best we can. And if you have any, anyone that's got a teenager that sees all the different stuff they can mm -hmm. do now with their PS3s and all that, we can do that now in police training. It makes us better at what we do. Um, I think it's, it's something that's worth investing into. Please continue with the work that you do. Well, thank you. Um, I can't express how grateful I am as, as a PBD girl, as a mom, as, as everything. I'm grateful for the work that you're doing here. Thank you. And you're welcome back anytime. I, as you can tell, I love talking about my police department. Yeah. This city here, I, like I said, I have a great bunch of men and women that, uh, you know, back me up all the time and, and uh, they do a great job out there. So I, I love talking about them. So anytime great. you want to come back, it was great to so see you again. Likewise, likewise. Take care, you all right? Take care of yourself. See you soon. Right. Yep, see you absolutely. Soon.